I'm pleased to introduce Arthur Haynes. He's the director of the Delta Institute of Natural History, a natural history and human ecology school in Western Maine. He offers classes, lectures, and regional guided trips that focus on nutritional anthropology, ethnobotany, and ancestral lifeways. A round of applause, please, for Arthur. Well, thanks, guys. How many people do we have in the room that are jazzed about wild food? And you can close your eyes if you want when you raise your hand so you don't let anybody in on that. All right, super. Um, what I'm here to do today is to take you on a historical tour of diets that have been practiced around the world. We have all this great scientific research that's coming out right now, but it's often done in the lab. In other words, it's done in an abstract fashion out of the context of real diets. When we get too focused on scientific study, we get sometimes rationale for heading in new directions. And I bet there isn't a person in the room that doesn't have a, a concept of diets that have just have done just that. They have taken us in the wrong direction and have actually resulted in poorer health than what we were doing in the first place. What I'm getting at is we rarely combine the historical evidence with the scientific evidence to find the union of those two methods of essentially learning what we might want to be including in our diets. And I hope that makes sense to everybody. Today, I'm not going to be focusing on as much of the scientific evidence, but I'm going to be provi providing the background, right? The people who have eaten a certain way for many generations so that we can actually understand the true effects of these diets it's on the next generation. So I'm clearly, I'm talking about hunter-gatherers today. And I want you to think of these people as those that were not cultivating plants. But specifically, we have to be talking about those people that have intact lifeways. In other words, prior to disruption by European colonists, who in many cases disrupted people on multiple continents from their lifeways that generated health. I've alluded to it already, and I need to say this again because it's vitally important. We're talking about people who ate certain kinds of foods for a long time so that we can observe those effects on the next generation. Any new diet that comes along, whether we want to admit it or not, is an experiment. And it's actually an experiment we're doing a little bit with ourselves, but more with the next generation because what we eat affects genetic expression. I'm going to use a lot of North American examples today, not exclusively, but a lot. And I do that purposefully so that you guys can connect in a better way. Oh, I've heard of that group, or I know what Northwestern North America means. You should not in any way think that what people ate here is unique. In other words, we might not be talking about the exact same species of plant or the exact same species of fish, on the African continent or the Asian continent, but there are grand similarities in what hunter-gatherers ate, and I'm gonna go through the last two-thirds of this talk is going to be about what those similarities were. The $50 million question, what's the relevance? Why should I even care? And, and there is really good sort of rationale to realize that many hunter-gatherer groups are not your direct ancestors. So what they did may not strictly apply to you. However, I want to answer this question with an example. That is one of 52 sets of teeth that were unearthed in northern Morocco from a place called Grotte des Pigeons, which is Pigeon Cave. And these were people who consumed acorns as a huge part of their dietary calories. And I want you to notice extensive dental caries as well as even tooth loss. Now, the researchers who found this said that they were eating a species, Quercus ilex, the home oak. And they attributed this to these people were having damage to their teeth because they were eating sweet acorns. Let me first make sure that you're aware that there's no such thing as a sweet acorn anywhere in the world. If any foraging instructor alludes to one, you automatically should start to wonder about their skill set. I just need that to be in your back pocket. There's no such thing as a sweet acorn, and in fact, even the home oak acorns were recorded as moderately bitter by people who didn't realize they were supposed to be sweet. But these people who relied on acorns for their staple had really 
poor health consequences as a result. But if we fast forward about 15,000 years ahead and we start looking at California natives, some California natives consumed as much as 50% of their yearly calories as acorns. That's kind of like what Americans do with wheat. Actually, it might even be more than that, right? And we know that when you rely on one food a lot, if there are any issues with it, it's eventually going to be expressed in your health. However, they didn't have those experiences. They did not suffer you know, massive tooth decay and tooth loss. In fact, dental caries were hard to discover in these people. So what gives? Well, the difference is how they process them. Acorns have anti-nutrients that need to be removed through leaching and soaking, methods that hadn't been established yet by paleo humans. So the paleo diet has given us essentially a look into maybe what we should consider eating from an evolutionary perspective, but the hunter-gatherer diets tell us how we should be eating that food. We need both. We need the what and the how, and that's what modern hunter-gatherer diets give us. Just as a quick tangent, if you'll allow for me, there are many people who work as archaeologists who themselves have become phenomenal nappers of stone. They've learned how to make points and blades, which gives them this insight into how these are created, what tools are needed, the level of skill, and also what they're looking for at the archaeological sites. In other words, their research is bettered by learning how to make the tools they're looking for. The paleo diet right now, unfortunately, has very little of that going on. The paleo diet is all about wild food, but yet we don't have much deep wild food expertise. It's all about the cultivated foods. And that means that some of the advice that gets given can sometimes be a little bit different than maybe what reality shows when we look at hunter-gatherer diets. So please just keep that in your mind as well. All right, so going back to relevance of hunter-gatherer diets. First of all, were they healthy at all? Well, every single person who was able to spend time with hunter-gatherers, realize most of them are gone from the world now, records health, an absence of chronic disease, an absence of extensive tooth loss. We know that they were physically fit, right? We can even analyze their teeth and bones to say they had great exceptional physical fitness. But a lot of the problems that when people think about hunter-gatherers, they want to comment on their longevity, right? Nasty, brutish, and short. That was the life of the hunter-gatherer. That's completely bogus, just to put that out there bluntly. There has been extensive focus on those groups that had relatively short lives, and it turns out they were the exception, not the rule. Um, if we remove a great deal of the confounding factors, we realize that hunter-gatherers, old age for them was late 60s, 70s, 80s, and even early 90s. And I ask you, how different is that than what Americans experience today? But to go a little bit further philosophically, any country that is, has 4% of the world's population but uses 25% of the world's resources, we have fossil fuel powered machines and migrant laborers do all of our menial and repetitive tasks, and we make up for health and age with pharmaceuticals and hip replacements, I don't really think we're the country that should be establishing longevity standards for the rest of the world. All right, you'll see pictures like this a lot, folks. And these will be used as evidence that hunter-gatherers did not have exceptional health. They did not have exceptional fitness. Um, I'd like to point out the sandals, the t-shirt, and the hat. These are contacted groups. Their lifeways have been severely impacted, and often they have been pushed to marginal lands by agriculturalists who, by their greater numbers, despite less physical strength, right, will just deal with it with a sheer number issue, were able to push them out. And so any information about the health of their diets based on these scenes is really kind of null and void. We can get gems out of it, but we can't look at this because they don't have an intact lifeway. Now, I'm betting many people in this room have heard of Weston Price. Is that true? Awesome. And you know he did some really pioneering work. I want you to understand what he did. All of the information that he collected on dental form and facial form pales in comparison to his approach. He found a marker of health. And instead of making up a diet and then standing back and waiting to see did that generate the effects he was looking for, 
He went around the world and found people who had that marker of health and then said, well, what are you eating? Nobody does this, folks. It is a very rare approach. Most diets make things up instead of going to see who are the people that possess the qualities that we want to emulate. But for those that don't know, he found that indigenous people everywhere around the world, those with their intact diets, had broader faces, all four wisdom teeth emerging, all teeth straight and uncrowded. I mean, seriously, how many people in this room have all four wisdom teeth unimpacted, all teeth straight, no crowding, with a beautiful bite like this? Raise your hands. And that's always the response I get. Folks, he observed this on all six continents. It is our genetic ancestral form that we are supposed to have. And it can even be observed in the young children of the indigenous cultures. What happens is we notice these widely flaring noses and these broad faces. Look at, look at how wide that arch is for all the teeth. And we say, well, look, we're not like people of the African continent. We're not like people of the Asian or the Australian continent. We're of the European continent. Well, what's happened is we don't have that connection to our hunter-gatherer ancestry because Europe has been agriculture-based for such a long time. But if we go to the herder-gatherers, the Sami of northern Europe and northwestern Russia, people who still had this intact life way, if you look at this lady, the one that's looking straight at us, can everyone see the wide nose, the wide round face? For the, for the people of European descent in this room, our ancestry was to have that wide face and room in our mouth for all of our teeth emerging. Frankly, folks, any diet that does not produce that in the next generation is deficient in nutrition, right? We celebrate narrowed faces and narrow nostrils as beauty. This is something that appeared on the cover of a magazine. This is a person who's suffering nutritional deficiency because of what her mother and her grandmother, and obviously the male uh, contribution to that, what her parents and grandparents consumed as food. We celebrate it as beauty. That is, and not to be um, callous to anybody that may know of people that have this, but it would be like putting somebody who has rickets on the cover of like, you know, men's health or something like that. They're suffering a nutritional deficiency and we're celebrating it as beauty. That's not the form that we were meant to have. So let's use this hunter-gatherer lens, okay? Hunter-gatherers did live healthy lives. They had relatively long lives, and most importantly, the highest criterion of a diet, the one that all diets should be judged against, is that they could produce healthy and well-formed children. We know that the standard American diet can't do that because, well, when I asked in the room, does anybody have these features I asked for, none of us do. Keep that in mind. I'm talking about intergenerational nutrition. It is something that most diets have no proven reputation for. So let's look at things that are stated by all kinds of diets and see if it makes any sense at all when we run it through this truthing filter of the hunter-gatherer lens. The very first thing that bears mention is all hunter-gatherer groups practiced omnivory. There's no exception to this. Now, does that mean that they practice omnivory year-round? Well, obviously not. Northern cultures may not have had access to plant foods, and we know that some equatorial cultures may have practiced veganism for weeks at a time while certain animal foods were not available to them. One of the wonderful wild food myths is that, well, the northern people were, could be strict carnivores. You should know that there is no group of people that ate only animal foods year-round. It does not exist. This is just one of the plants on Kenya peploides that was collected by a far northern culture, the Anupiat. They cooked and or fermented, um, or excuse me, or fermented this food. It was one of the greens that they consumed when available. And here's a, here's a really cool relative of the raspberry, Rubus camimoris. It's called baked appleberry. It is exactly what it tastes like. It's like a baked apple coming out of the oven. And these were gathered in massive quantities so that they were eaten not only during the late summer, but even into the winter. So the people that we think of as being carnivores, in fact, weren't. And just another quick tidbit, these people, these far northern people, only 1% of their calories may have come from plant foods, but yet 50% of their vitamin C came from that 1%. Raw and cooked. 
all groups, all hunter-gatherer groups ate a mixture of raw and cooked foods. Equatorial people who did not need fires to keep warm had them going to be able to cook food. The Eskimo, the raw meat eaters, also cooked certain foods all the time. Now, one of the things that's really important that you understand is that the cooking of food predates the emergence of Homo sapiens. We didn't at just some point start cooking. We inherited it from our hominid ancestors. The controlled use of fire, direct evidence for this, goes back now one million years. Now, you might guess that a couple of pieces of wood, which people like to refer to as rubbing them together, which is actually not how you start a fire in most parts of the world. You spin one stick on a stationary piece of wood, um, just so that's out there. Right? Um, Evidence of that is really hard to find. We're talking about organic materials, but if we look at the physical form of Homo erectus, a species that had weaker jaw muscles, and we know this because of the attachment points for the connective tissue. They need to be bigger when there's more muscle bulk. Weaker dentition, a much smaller rib cage than the forms that predated it. All of this is indicating that this hominid, this extinct hominid, was cooking its food. Right? It was being pre the food was being pre-digested by heat, and we could shorten up the digestive tract as a result. You should know, you should know that, and what's really interesting is there is so much neural cells needed to sort of guide and process the food through our intestinal tract that when we shorten this up, our body could dedicate resources here. We do see in the archaeological record, as the rib cage shrinks, the head grows. Whether anybody wants to admit it or not, the physical form that you see here today is the result of fire. We are all born of the fire, so to speak. All right, another trait, full utilization of animals. We didn't just eat the lean muscle meat and throw the rest of the animal away or feed that to our dogs, right? The dogs actually get deeper nutrition when we give them the organ meats than what we take in. Things like roe and the male, sort of analog of that, the milk, were regarded as sacred foods to make sure that the next generation could be healthy. Modern fishermen usually throw this stuff away now, and again, we're just back to the lean muscle meat. You know, there is research showing that vegans suffer lower rates of cancer than omnivores, and we, we all know that these types of studies often suffer from a healthy user bias. In other words, vegans tend to be very health conscious, to their credit. And omnivores, well, it's the whole gamut of people, so you end up with health conscious people against some who are and some who aren't. So that's a really important confounding factor. But that said, there's probably some validity to it based on how we practice omnivory today. It turns out lean muscle meat Rich in methionine, low in glycine, actually promotes IGF-1 levels. And in an unhealthy person, that promotes cancer. And it turns out that uh, a great study that was done in laboratory animals showed that just supplementing with glycine, this is the gelatin-rich uh, amino acid that will come from bone broths, connective tissue, and even some fatty organs, completely nullified those elevated IGF-1 levels. In other words, if you're interested as an omnivore in keeping cancer out of you and your lineage, full utilization of the animal. Plant diversity, I'm gonna be on this one for a little while, so strap in. Because this is one of the biggest places, in my opinion, that the paleo diet falls short. And you'll, I'm gonna lead you on for that in, in hopefully what is a non-confrontational manner. I'm not trying to uh, break up any successful strategy that people may have, but I do want to let you know we're practicing an extremely different diet than what has ever gone on before on this planet. This is, this is a great example. This plant was referred to as Magaka wequensis by the indigenous who ate it. This is the shoots of what's called wild sarsaparilla. Its omega-6 to omega-3 uh, ratio is 0.27. In other words, a lot of alpha linoleic acid, right? That's the kind of foods we need in our diet. We're talking about highly anti-inflammatory foods. Here's Micranthes pennsylvanica. This was used as both a green as well as a, an early spring shoot by the Cherokee natives. They consumed over 100 species of plants. That's huge diversity. 
Here's a Schizophyton. How many people have heard of the Mongongo tree? Cool. This was something that was heavily utilized by the Kung of southern, uh, southern Africa. Now, these people uh, consumed the nut of this plant. It was something that was extremely rich in ALA, unlike a lot of nuts, which actually are rich in omega-6 fatty acids. The Kung were documented in the 1960s to consume 85 species of plants. It was probably much higher than that because the time the 60s rolled around, you're talking about a tremendous loss of ethnobotanical knowledge in these cultures. The Hausa of Western Africa were documented to consume 119 food plants. Even in the far north, this is an Anupiat lady collecting the roots of Hidisarum alpinum. She would find rodent caches where they had stacked up the roots and she would remove them and then leave a little piece of dried fish as an offering of gratitude to that rodent. That's kind of a different life view, right? We view rodents pretty differently than that. But even in the far north, they were documented. I mean, we're talking near the limit of where humans can exist sustainably for, through the year. 40 species of plants that were documented. Most Americans are reported to consume about 30 species or less. And you're thinking, how on earth can that be possible? I know I eat more species than that. Well, do remember, acorn squash, buttercup squash, Hubbard squash, winter squash, it's all the same species. It's all cucurbita maxima, just different cultivated forms of it. Remember that broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kohlrabi, collard greens, kale, and all of the other things listed up here, it's all the same species, Brassica oleracea. You actually get less plant diversity in your diet than you probably believe because you're just dealing with genetically modified forms of the same species. And I know people don't like hearing about that. I'm gonna prove to you that genetic modification occurs even outside of the laboratory. This plant that you see here is the wild progenitor of one of the commonly eaten cultivated plants in this country. And I want you to realize that it is a rich source of provitamin A, vitamin C, the plant form of vitamin D, which would be D2. It contains vitamin E, a number of B-complex vitamins, but equally importantly, it possesses its phytochemistry. It has sedative, analgesic, and antispasmodic qualities that all lend beneficial results to our body. And it's now this. Would anybody describe lettuce as medicinal or a powerhouse of nutrition? We certainly know that the leaf lettuce forms are better than, say, iceberg lettuce, right? But the further we move away from the wild progenitor, the more phytochemistry and the more nutrition we lose. And that's really important because that phytochemistry does all sorts of wonderful things in your body. It fights cancer. It fights oxidation. It builds in anti-inflammation uh, anti in your body instead of the opposite. To go from this to this requires genetic modification. It just does it through a very imprecise process of breeding, but it is still genetic modification foods that Paleolithic people and hunter-gatherers didn't eat until much more recently in history. Now, let's give one example of the nutritional content of cultivated versus wild foods. I know everyone recognizes the citrus fruit. What's it rich in? Vitamin C, we're all told that. I'm glad that you didn't say ascorbic acid because ascorbic acid is only one piece of vitamin C. Um, and that's what the marketing campaign has convinced in all of us. It isn't particularly good, not when it's compared against wild species. There are loads of plants that completely annihilate, for, in a comparison, the vitamin C content of this plant. Here's a Rosa rugosa. This is a native of Asia that is now naturalized up and down the east coast of North America. This particular plant contains over 50 times the vitamin C of oranges. That's not a figure of speech. It's literally over 50 times. And remember that vitamin C in those doses is anti-inflammatory. It's an antioxidant for the liquid portion of your cell. It works with vitamin E. Um, wound healing can't be accomplished. Gum health is 
absent without vitamin C, and those were the doses that hunter-gatherers were getting. Not to mention, back to that full utilization theory that we were talking about, the seed-like fruits on the inside, we hate seeds. We breed seeds out of everything, and when we do that, we breed out nutrition. The, the seed-like fruits of this species are a really rich source of omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin E. All right, grains. Right, I'm waiting for the crosses to come up. Um, this, this is like one of the most perfect examples for examining dietary mythology. There is a great reason for people to avoid certain grains because we have had our health harmed by them. So the message has become never eat grain. But many hunter-gatherers consumed grains. If you, if you stood here and let me list them all off for you, you'd fall asleep before I finished. And some of those people relied on grains as staples, not just as starvation food as is commonly touted. The point is, is we have all these people consuming grain, and remember, grain consumption goes back 105,000 years. It actually is paleo. And they're consuming these foods without health issues. It tells us that this overly simplified message of never eat grain is not accurate. Now I'm gonna break this to you. Nutrition is more complex than that. You can't just say, don't do this, because if somebody did it and experienced health, there's something wrong with that statement. So the message needs to be more complicated. It needs to be diversify your diet, which means eat less grain. It, it needs to be seek out wild and heirloom kinds, those species that still have your phytochemistry and still have their nutrition. And it needs to be select gluten-free kinds so that you stop damaging your intestines. And for the most part, there are exceptions to this, most of the grains that were used as staples by hunter-gatherers and herder-gatherers were gluten-free. And like I said, there are ex um, examples that go contrary to that, like the barley that's used by the herder-gatherers of Tibet. Now, we often hear that grains are nutritionally poor, you should never eat them. That's a 100 gram serving of grass-fed beef, and there is a 100 gram serving of wild rice. A big assortment of nutrients there, vitamins and minerals. Can anybody see what I'm trying to depict with this? Where's the big difference that you've been told? In fact, wild rice beats it in many places, right? And these aren't made up statistics, I can send you this as well as the citations for these, if you'd like. The point being is what you have heard about grains and how horrible they are for your health is all based on cultivated grains. Said another way, it's all based on genetically modified grains, okay? All right, so enough about plants. Let's get into food processing. Americans love processed food, right? Now, we have a negative image of food processing, but in fact, it happened all the time. Natives relied on food processing because not all foods could be eaten in the form they're gathered from the wild. I, I personally dislike the fact that raw has become to mean just uncooked. For me, a lot of foods are not eaten raw because they are processed in some way, which might include cooking. But I would also consider things like leaching, diluting, drying, soaking, all of those chemically change the plants. Those are forms of processing. They're not raw foods anymore. Um, here, here's, a, here's a hoopa woman of, of um, California, and she is processing Quercus lobata, the valley oak. Absolute necessity. I've already sort of alluded to this before. Both phytic acid and tannins, which chelate with minerals and make them unavailable to your body. They learned that without this process, they harmed their health, not bolstered their health. Seasonality. We live in the United States and we do not have to worry about seasonality. We can have whatever food when we want it because it just gets flown in. Well, maybe that is a very unnatural aspect of our diet, right? Eggs, not available year-round to most people. Now, as we approach the equator, maybe that changes a bit, but obviously as we step into temperate, boreal, and arctic areas, we run into problems with having eggs year-round. I'm not stating eggs are bad, I love them, just making the point that they weren't available to most people year-round. Whoops, excuse me. Greens like that, not available to most people year round. And even when species of, of 
plants that we would consume like this in the early part of the season, even if they're around in the late part of the summer. Any of you who do foraging will know that plants accumulate bitter and distasteful compounds as insect activity, their insect herbivores, increases. They become distasteful to ward off their predators. And plants that we could consume in the early part of the year, we can't consume later in the year because they have become medicine, not food. And in fact, the belief that a salad is a necessary part of the diet year-round is soundly rejected by looking at many hunter-gatherer groups who may not have consumed a lot of green plants for a big portion of the year, or I should say a significant portion of the year. Whoa. Sorry about that. But of course we know that some foods could be dried and stored, right? So it's really important if a food was not available year round, but it could be stored in some way, usually through drying and freezing, sometimes through fermentation or storage in oil, like the Inuit did, we could have this. Here's low bush blueberry. Um, this was a species that was dried and used as a winter food by a number of northern cultures, so it was eaten outside of its season. As well, maple sugar was produced by natives of the Northeast and the Great Lakes region. They did this by collecting the tree sap from maples and then boiling off all the water and actually creating a granulated sugar. So they could have the sweetener outside of the season when sap was flowing. Food refinement, another thing that Americans are really hip on, even though they may not be aware that this is really compromising their health. With food refinement, we use laboratory or chemical processes or milling processes that were not possible for hunter-gatherers to strip away microscopic components of the food, and then we'd add things back, right? Color, anti-caking agents, synthetic forms of the vitamins, and, of course, that all comes um, with some issue. <coughs> Even the sugars that we eat as Americans, white sugar, absolutely devoid of all mineral nutrition. In fact, your body uses up stores of nutrition to deal with this food when you ingest it. Whereas if we look at wild sugars, this is an example of some maple sugar, it's rich in a few minerals and possesses others. And we're talking things like mag manganese, magnesium, potassium, calcium, iron, phosphorus. It actually still retains a great deal of its nutrition. In fact, it retains all of it. Seed oils, right? We refine the foods by drawing these out of the seeds. So we end up getting these polyunsaturated fatty acids from outside of the natural container that it was put in, which means that we eat it without the fiber, but most importantly, it's removed from the protective antioxidants that were in that fruit or seed, so it is now free to start going rancid. It becomes heavily oxidized, and then we make it worse by cooking with it. It's another topic altogether, but the point is these types of polyunsaturated fatty acids were almost always consumed with their fruit intact. So they simply didn't run into the cardiovascular issues, the worsening of diabetes, the suppression of the immune system, the pro-inflammatory properties that we as people living in an affluent country do. Lipids, fats, right? Politically correct nutrition touts that we should be highly limiting our fats, especially as we leave the liquid ones and go towards saturated ones. And I'll have you know, if you don't already, that hunter-gatherers had no phobia of fats, right? The USDA and the FDA hadn't gotten to them yet. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It turns out that a lot of the the estimates of how much fat was consumed by hunter-gatherers are a little bit low, and that's because it was primarily calculations of body fat that have been performed, separate from all of the fatty organs, like the brain, the liver, the fat that encases the heart. And so we know that hunter-gatherers ate diets that were pretty rich in fat. But that is not to say they are ketogenic. That's sort of all the craze right now. In fact, very few groups actually consumed ketogenic diets. And no group, not one group on the planet, consumed a ketogenic diet throughout the year. That is a new diet, 
anyone who is breaking into that, that we don't fully know the consequences of that diet on the next generation. Many of you are probably aware, because of your interest in the paleo diet, one of the things that this has really brought forward that's super helpful is the fact that the ratio of two essential polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6 to omega-3. Hunter-gatherer groups, approximately one to one to three to one ratio of those two essential fatty acids. Here in the modern world, we're looking at ratios like eight to one and 24 to one. And in fact, that 24 to 1 ratio was from a country where they were practicing a high degree of vegetarianism. It turns out they had as much cardiovascular risk as people do on the standard American diet. I had mine tested. I was very happy to be allied with the Quebec Cree. Now, this is really important because the amount of fats consumed by Americans is equal to that consumed by hunter-gatherers. But there's a big difference. Our fats tend to come from seed oils, trans fats, and dairy, right? As opposed to saturated and monounsaturated fats, as well as polyunsaturated fats from plant and animal foods in a more whole form. Now, I'm not attempting to be too Freudian here, but we're going to talk about breast meat a little bit. And here's the modern augmented broiler chicken with this huge amount of lean muscle meat relative to its fatty organs. Here's a comparable upland game bird, the ruffed grouse. Notice the difference. This animal has much less lean muscle meat to the ratio of its organs, right? These fatty muscles. When we consume animals, our domesticated animals, this is one of the major differences between them and wild animals. There's less super nutrient dense stuff to the less nutrient dense stuff, if you will. Simple sugars, glucose, fructose, and uh, glucose, fructose, and sucrose were consumed everywhere they were available. They were not limited in any way. Uh, this is a species that's um, called shadbush, or in the West, it's called Saskatoon. And it was eaten around the continent. And in fact, even the Okanagan of Northwestern North America used it as a staple when it was available. Now remember, they were using a sugar-rich food as a staple without experiencing any of the chronic health effects that we do with a diet rich in cane sugar and high fructose corn syrup. And this fruit was stored for consumption outside of the winter, excuse me, outside of the growing season. So it was something that was consumed for months when the seasons allowed for the collection of lots of material. Here's choke cherry, a vitally important plant to the Plains Indians. This was stored in large quantities so they could consume it all the way through the winter as a stored food. It was one of these wonderful foods that was often combined with animal fat, the tallow from buffalo. It was this awesome gender combining food because you took the fruits of the labor of the men and the women and they came together to create pemmican from their efforts. Lots of groups collected tree saps, to create sweeteners. Now, <coughs> they didn't necessarily store it as syrup as we do today because they didn't have the technology to have mason jars. So they had to take it down to a dried form, which would be the sugar, or they had to use it immediately. And it isn't just maples that are used. There are a large number of species, tree species that can be used for this. And in fact, even northern cultures, all the way to the Hudson Bay, like the Cree, were tapping birches as a way of making syrup that would be um, used for um, sort of more immediate ingestion. You should be aware that there are accounts of the Anishinaabe when the men would go out to the camps to collect the sap and be boiling it down through one of a couple of methods that they did. They were busy. They weren't hunting. There's all this collecting and boiling to do. Guess what they ate during those weeks in large amounts? They ate the syrup and yet we still see healthy and well-formed children being produced by these groups. And if you've seen any of the great documentaries that are going on now, we know in the old world where honey-producing bees are, um, are found, people went through 
great uh, lengths to get up into the trees and up onto the cliffs to find these animals and to select their honey, this nutrient-rich sweetener. And finally, salt. Salt was another thing that was sought out whenever they could locate it. These are Maliseet, they're in northern Maine. They are a long way from the coast. They have stories of traveling all the way out to the ocean and even mention a couple of different methods of processing ocean water to be able to get salt. Of course, it was not a refined salt that we have on our tables now, but a mineral-rich sea salt. Salt pans from people in the Midwest where they would evaporate brine to create salt. And even species that occur both on the coast and inland that actually accumulated salt in their tissue. Or like the hickories, we can burn these leaves to produce a salty tasting um, spice, if you will. It was used to season food. But a large number of ways that hunter-gatherers sought out salt. So I want to sum this all up in 30 seconds. And I've already said some of this. Nutrition is far more complex than simple statements. And whenever we look at hunter-gatherer diets, we notice that they did a lot of the things that we said you can't do. And so we need to sort of bolster up those statements and actually make them more accurate. There's where you can find me, folks. My friend Chris Armstrong is on Primal Docs and publishes a lot of my stuff. Hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for your time. I was just wondering, I was just wondering um, you said that they ate a lot of sugar uh, for various parts of the year, but they didn't seem to have some of the effects that we see today. I know there's... Um, is there any explanation other than maybe like the overprocessing of sugar today, or I mean, how would you explain that? I, I think we can go into a, a large number of mitigating effects of the sugars that they consumed. One of them being massive amounts of movement. They weren't sedentary. I mean, there are reports of people moving 100 kilometers in a week period. There were no cars. There were no fossil, you know, fossil fuel powered machines to do their work for them. And so a big issue, look at the people who carb load, endurance athletes and that kind of thing. Those people are not experiencing the effects because they're burning off those relatively simple carbohydrates that they're taking in. I think they're, they're the presence of large amounts of movement in their life is one of the biggest mitigating factors. So for a healthy, active adult, perhaps natural forms of sugar, like I showed in this program, are not detrimental to your health. Okay, so um, from what you said and from what I understand, um, most if not all of the produce that's available to us, even at somewhere like Whole Foods or the farmer's markets, are cultivars rather than wild foods. That's right. Um, so what do you suggest to the average person? Like how do we have to go forage it ourselves to find wild food? And is that necessary? And specifically, <coughs> I've been reading a lot about how um, the fruits, the, even the organic fruits that we get in Whole Foods, have apparently been... Um, you know, selectively bred to be extremely high in sugar, um, mm -hmm. not not like what uh, the hunter-gatherers would have had. So for that reason, would you recommend us avoiding fruit? No, um, I wouldn't recommend you avoiding fruit or avoiding any other thing for that matter. Let's face it, um, there are lots of people who live in areas where they can't forage, right? I mean, that's... Finding your own wild food is super empowering. It builds that connection to the landscape that many moderns, as we like to call, you know, the people, the domesticated people that all of us in this room, unfortunately, are. We've lost that connection to our landscapes. And for those that can't forage for wild foods, which are the most nutritionally dense foods, and that's documented in numerous studies, you have to find less modified foods. So let me give you some examples of that. Greens get bitter, that's normal, but our greens that we like aren't. But you can seek out strong tasting leafy greens. Things like arugula, which is a mustard, has a much stronger flavor. That means its phytochemistry is still intact. It's exerting anti-cancer activity when you eat it. How many people know endive? 
right? That's a bitter green. It still has its phytochemistry intact. So it's a, it's a little bit of research to find those that have been less modified. One more example, if you go into a store and you buy a blueberry or a raspberry, you know that when you go out into the field, those two things look quite a bit alike, right? It's not like the lettuce I showed or corn, or if you saw the wild progenitor of eggplant, don't look anything alike. So I'm looking for things that have their ancestral form and their ancestral flavor. I have not bought a seedless, that is, there's your ticket right there that it's lost a lot of its nutrition. I have not bought a seedless watermelon for as long as, I can't tell you how long it's been. That is the epitome of what I don't want in my diet. It's a lot of sugar, and it's lost its phytochemistry. Now, that's not to say it doesn't have some benefit, but it doesn't have maximal benefit. So I'm hoping that helps. It's learning to seek less modified foods. Uh, my friend Daniel Vitalis and I are getting ready to do an article on this to help guide people through shopping in the supermarket to find those foods that have at least some of their ancestral nutrition. And, and so that will help you out. We're hoping to have that in a couple of weeks, actually. Okay. You answered most of my question with her question. Cool. I, I'm just curious, just for an example, just humor me. What do you eat in a week, or what does your year look like hunting it, and gathering? I can't answer because it changes every few weeks. It's based on what's available on the landscape. But, I mean, I do store foods. There are foods that I can gather in abundance. I mean, I eat lots of acorns, and acorns can be dried so I can eat them through the year. I get to have a wild plant food year round. I eat wild rice. It's a food that I gather in abundance because it's another wild plant that I can dry and store and have it through the year. Um, in the winter time, my vitamin C is coming from raw animal foods to some extent, but also from teas made of the bark of all kinds of evergreens like pines, spruces, firs and those kinds of trees because they're extremely rich. They, they, I mean, literally, they blow oranges and those citrus roots out of the water. Um, it's coming up. I'm soon to be collecting all kinds of spring greens because that's what's available. But if you look at my diet in the fall, there's hardly any greens in it. They just don't exist. Now, I, I, I'm at the farmer's markets too. I don't want to give you the impression that I eat exclusively wild food, but I eat more wild food than anybody I know personally. And so that it's a really neat place to be because you start, when you're eating all that food, you're learning about how artificial some aspects of our diet actually are. Does that help at all? Yeah, yeah cool. Hi, Arthur. My question is, uh, we were talking earlier about um, basically that our food uh, helps with our expression and our genetics. And I was just wondering, is there any idea of how long or how many generations it would take to get back to something closer to the wild or a feral human? Because I myself have tiger teeth and like, I've grown to like it, but you know, I think about my next generation, my children, and what I eat, and like, how long is there any idea of how long that would take? If you can tell me one person who has been, you know, comes from a lineage that eats cultivated plants, who has gone back to a completely wild diet, I'll talk to them and answer that question for you. Um, but not to sort of, <laughs> excuse me, not to duck that completely. Um, we do know that the Western Price um, proponents are actually seeing a broadening of the face, some emergence of wisdom teeth, like it's coming back, our ancestral form. Um, I recently had my daughter, who's going to be eating, you know, lots of really sacred foods. I mean, she's already experienced liver, egg yolk, wild rice, salmon roe, et cetera. And um, <coughs> we'll see if it makes any difference. Um, the thing to really remember is it took us a lot of generations to get to the physical degeneration that we experience now. I mean, Western Price noticed in one generation some pretty profound changes, but we've been many generations. And we're not going to undo that in one generation. We have to turn it around, start incorporating some concepts that have been presented here, that are presented in the paleo diet, that are presented in the Western Price diet, etc., and sort of rebuild our genetic health. 
<laughs> Thanks. I really enjoyed your talk. I'm back here. Oh, hey, Chris. <laughs> really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I just want to tell you, you probably know this, but people in the audience might not. You mentioned Mongongo nuts. There's this great story of an anthropologist who was living with the Kung, and he asked them, you know, why don't you people farm? It, it, you could farm, you could have food all the time, you wouldn't have to walk. And the answer was, why should we farm when there are so many Mongongo nuts in the world? <coughs> Which you, sums it right up. You, uh, you, you see it so much, right? When, when before the landscape was degraded, you know that many hunter-gatherers spent four hours or less a day with their food procurement. That left a lot of time for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. For anybody um, that, that has heard my friend Daniel speaking, it's like they did, you know? It was just a part of their culture that they had time for. Agriculturalists, it's dawn to dusk. All this backbreaking labor just so that we can have storable foods that actually destroy our genetic health. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> For those of us that don't have access to the Internet, what is the how much can using herbs and other wild foods like that in small quantities, obviously you can't you know, eat your whole diet of herbs, <laughs> but how much can that compensate for lack of other wild foods in the diet? Uh, certainly some, we know that. Um, there's a great research going on, and a lot of the spices turn out to be some of our highest antioxidant foods that, that can be regularly found in the supermarket. I mean, our spices are plants that we've intentionally not meddled with too much because they have their phytochemistry. It's what we're seeking as flavors. Um, but, but spice alone isn't going to do it. And so one of the things, as, as I mentioned um, to this lady, seeking out those less modified plant foods is a sort of next best option to pulling in as much nutrition as you can. I mean, but that said, they have compared, there's been numerous studies that have looked at things like blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, and every single time the wild version comes out with much higher antioxidant levels, no matter what continent we're doing this on, than the cultivated kinds. So, move. <laughs> I realize that's not, that's not an option for everybody, but Weston Price, in his work looking at facial form and dentition, there was not a single group, even though he didn't always mention it, there was not a single group that he observed that didn't consume some proportion of wild plants in their diets to get the form that he was seeing, not one. So if you're transplanting wild foods, so let's say you go down by the river and you find mm -hmm. some nettle and dandelion and plant them in your yard, does that ruin no. the wild quality? No. Are, are, are you going to tend them and water them and pick their predators off, or are you going to let that happen? Remember, because a lot of the phytochemistry that's good for our bodies are their defense mechanisms. When we cultivate plants and we spray all kinds of pesticides on them, let alone what's happening to the other than human persons we share this world with, which we don't often think about, all of that tending of those plants means that cultivated species don't have to ramp up their defense mechanisms. I mean, this costs the plants energy. They're not going to do it if they don't have to, and we suffer as a result. So, no, let them grow and let things attack them. Cool. <clears throat> so since uh, foraging wild foods is ironically such a luxury these days, <laughs> yeah, right. how, what do you see... Um, for the future, like could you, you talk about the, the bark that you picked to make the tea, could you do something like turn that into a product that you could sell or would that sort of look like a, a, a different kind of problem? Well, they do that already. I mean, they have pine bark that you can purchase for its antioxidant ability. It's extremely expensive, so it's only available to people who have spare money. The problem with wild plants is they haven't been genetically modified, which means they don't have uniform ripening. That's what we want in the field, right? The machine goes through once and comes back. They don't, they don't all have what we want at the same level on the plant. It's actually really easy to genetically modify the plant to put it exactly where the machine will grab it. But every time we do this kind of stuff, we lose nutrition, right? The wild food products are expensive because it requires people to do the work and often to go into the field multiple times. So just 
to leave plants aside for a minute and remember that there is still one food that's wild and widely available in many places, and hopefully we won't ruin this with our stewardship of the oceans. It's wild-caught seafood that hasn't been genetically modified. And so that's one thing that you can readily purchase in many places that gives you that depth of nutrition found in wild foods. Just a quick question about the, the nightshades. I saw it on one of your slides, but could you comment on, uh, do, you, do you always discourage against eating nightshades? Or is it, is never. never I, I never discourage it. Oh, okay. and, and the reason, again, is that we're eaten in large amounts when they were available, and many of these were berries and things that could be ingested raw on the spot, and they did not elicit the effects that we see in unhealthy people who are then taking in anti-inflammatory compounds. That is not to say that people who are experiencing issues shouldn't avoid nightshades. That's a different program altogether, but healthy adults eating wild nightshades, I eat them every chance I get.